Let's build a register file. There are 32 registers of 32 bits wide. They're labeled X0 to X31. And those labels are not to be confused with their conventional labels or alternate labels, such as SP for stack pointer, RA for return address, TP for thread pointer, GP for global pointer, I think, and so forth. There, there are a bunch of alternate names that are used conventionally to refer to risk five registers and the green sheet that I have referenced in the uh, in the notes on the video will tell you what the conventional labels are and in fact if you write an assembly program and you use the x0 to x31 names for your registers and you uh, assemble the program and then you disassemble the program usually you'll find that the disassembler is going to change those label names those register names to the convention as opposed to what it is that that you put them in, recognize that those labels, when they get converted to machine instructions, they're just indexes. So if you say, you know, X1, that just convert gets converted to the machine instruction. Within the machine instruction, they just gets converted to the number one. And so a disassembler has no idea when it's converting from machine language back to assembly language, what you meant or what you said whenever you wrote the program in the first place. So normally when I build modules in Logisim, I start with inputs and outputs. But I think this time, no, just knowing this information, if this is all the information that you knew, why don't we just start by creating a module with these 32 registers? I think that's a good place to start. So we'll just use the register component. And these need to be 32 bits. And so, Let's put some tunnels on all of these inputs and outputs because we're not going to want to run wires everywhere. Now we need 32 of these things. So There are our 32 registers. How do we know how many of these things need to be accessed at any given time if, you know, certainly all 32 of them don't need to be? In order to know that, uh, you need to know something about the RISC-V ISA, the Instruction Set Architecture. There are different types of instructions for a RISC-V CPU. They're all 32 bits in length. But there are different quote unquote record types, which basically means that the 32 bits are broken down in different ways, depending upon the class of instruction that you're talking about. In particular, there is one record type called the S type. And that type takes the form of instructions such as add. So we want to do an add operation. And the first parameter of the add instruction is the destination register which is actually the index of the register that you want the result to go into, index being from 0 to 31, right? Uh, the second parameter is the source register. That's register source 1. You typically see RS1. And then the second parameter is the second register that you're doing this summation with. So that's register source 2. So this instruction right here, if you look at all of the other RISC-V instruction types, you will see that none of them access any more registers simultaneously than this kind of instruction. And this is add is one example of an S type instruction. You know, there's sub, there's sub for subtract and uh, XOR for exclusive OR and so forth. What this tells us then for this module is we obviously need a register source one index input and a register source two index input. So why don't we just go ahead and put that out there since we know that. Now, being that it's an index, it's indexing into what? It's indexing into the, the particular register we're talking about. There's 32 of them. So how many bits do we need? Well, we need five bits to rep represent 32 different registers. 
typically when I'm trying to display this in Logisim, I, I don't want to see this as binary. I want to see this as usually unsigned decimal because, you know, again, I'm talking about a register from one to 30, from zero to 31. I want to see that as decimal typically. And given that this is a, an index, I want to at least somehow indicate that this is an index by naming it such. So register source index one is what I'm going to call it. And then we need RS, RS2, so we're going to call this RSI2 for the second index on the, on the instruction. And then finally, we need the destination register. And again, this is an index, so we're going to call this RDI. Register, uh, register destination index. And there's no one or two because there's just one destination. If we think about then this module, this, this module is, is basically just a register access module. It doesn't actually perform the instruction. Performing an add instruction is typically left to a module called the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, which basically does all the arithmetic functions for you. The input for this are the indexes. So to get the value of what is in these registers, you need to spit the value out so that the ALU can consume those values and perform the operation. So that what that really means then is that we need outputs representing the data value at each one of these indices. So let's do that. Now the output I am going to make hex because usually you're looking at hex values for the values of these registers. Always make sure to rep represent it as an output. It'll keep red lines from showing up on your, on your diagram. Uh, so we're going to call this, uh, well, we might as well just call this RS1 because that is the value of the first operand in your instruction. And we're going to call the second one RS2. If we think about the destination register, the ALU is going to spit out the result. And we need that result stored somewhere, right? We need the actual value stored. So we need to know what register it's going to get put into. And that's what this RDI is, it represents the index of the register to put the value into, but we also need the value itself that's going to go into the, this, the particular register referenced by RDI. So we need one of these as an input now. which will be the value called RD. When we write that value, that value obviously is not going to get written to all the registers. It's only going to get written to the destination register referenced by RDI. We're going to take a pin called write enable. So we'll just call this uh, WE for write enable. And it's one bit. So why don't we put tunnels on each one of these? Because again, I'm not going to have uh, wires running everywhere. So how do we hook these up? The first value that I'm going to deal with, the write enable value. So when we have a value coming in on RD and an in, in, in a index associated with that value with RDI, which of these write enables 
need to be turned on? Well, the, the one that needs to be turned on is the one identified by RDI. So why don't we use a uh, multiplexer And in fact, a demultiplexer is what we need because we want the value of the write enable to come in, and then we want that value routed to the appropriate write enable uh, on the appropriate register identified by the index here. So this demuxer needs, well, it needs 30, it needs uh, one data bit because we have the write enable coming in, and the select bits, it needs five select bits because we've got the 32 different registers to deal with. So we need something like that. And then, of course, for the input, that is the write enable. And in order to select the one that we want to write to, well, that is the destination register index. And then we simply need tunnels connected to each one of these. And now we just need to name these. All right, so now that we have all those tunnels in, we can go back up to the actual registers to all the write enables. And you know what I just realized? I actually want to call these X as opposed to R, because I'm also going to call each one of these. So this is going to be X0, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and label all of these. And so now I'm going to go back and change all these to X. Okay, now let's go in and fill in all of our write enables. Good. Now we have all of the write enable flags taken care of. And uh, one thing I noticed that we, the additional thing we could just take care of real quick is the clock, because we have the clock pins already labeled, but I did not put an input for the clock, which is going to be needed. So let's just simply take care of that. Okay, so now I have our clock input pin. The data value that could be written into each one of the registers, and that data value is, of course, RD, right? And so the input to each one of these registers at any given time that write enable is high should be RDT. So the D value, I'm going to label all of these as RDT. So now what do we need? We need a way to get the data value referenced by register source one and register source two index into 
these output pins. And how are we going to do that? If we use a DMUX to sort of break out one input into all of its outputs, we basically need a MUX to multiplex all of the outputs from the registers into one and only one set of output pins, be it for register one or for register two. So why don't we work through that? Uh, I'm going to move these over, kind of get them out of the way. And let's create a MUX. Let's work on RS1 first. So we need a multiplexer over here. And we need data, 32 data bits because we're going to take the value of the register. And so how many data, how many select pins do we need? Well, we need we need to select from amongst 32 different registers and then I, therefore again the index is going to be 5 bits. The output if this is going to be the register 1 mux that this is going to be the output. Let me zoom up a bit. This pin here, the select pin, well, that's, that's going to be this index value. Each one of the values coming into the MUX is basically the queue from its respective register. So let's go ahead and put tunnels on each one of these values, kind of similar to the, the process that I just did on the DMUX. Okay, that's done. Let's go name all of the Q outputs as I'd started to do. Great, now that we have all of our Outputs from our registers labeled. Let me zoom back out here. This is kind of what this looks like. Lots of small print, I know, but you've seen it being done along the way here. Uh, now, the last thing that remains, I believe, is we've got RS1 wired up. I bet we don't have uh, RS2 wired up. And the good news is that's just a copy and paste because, again, it comes from the same registers. We have, obviously, a different output and a different index selector, but we can simply copy this. And then all we have to do is change the labels. And I believe there we have a register file. Let's test this out. I want to see this work. So first of all, let's put in, uh, let's just put in some values. So I'm going to, I'm going to go into simulation or go into data poke mode here. And I'm going to put in, uh, I'm going to put in a one at location one, and I'm going to put a two into location two. And then I'm going to put a 1, and I'm going to put a 2 into our uh, register location index. And right away, if you look here, 
at our outputs, you can see RS1 has already got a 1 in it, and RS2 has already got a 2 in it. So far, so good. Now what happens if we want to write? So if we want to write in our, uh, in our circuit, we need a clock. Now this clock is defined as a pin. It's not defined as an actual clock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this pin. And instead, I'm going to just jam a clock in here because we want to be able to tick the clock. Because in order to write to a register, you, you need a clock tick in order to do that because these are uh, these are synchronous devices. And so uh, let's pick register uh, the destination register index. Let's make that three. You'll notice that register three has nothing in it right now. This is in hex, so we're going to write the number three into register number three. And in order to do that, we need write enable to be high. So let's set that to high. And then we need to tick the clock. So let's go ahead and go into simulation mode. And we are going to tick the clock one full clock cycle. So what I'm expecting to happen here is that for register three, referenced by the index three, the value three should be written here. So let's tick the clock once and see what happens. There's a tick. Boom, there's our three written into register three. And so, you know, if we go to, let's pick just an arbitrary register like register nine, I don't know. So let's change that to nine. Let's change this to, let's increment this up to nine. Boom, there we go. Let's tick the clock. So register nine is right here. So if I tick, boom, there's register nine. And you'll notice that the write enable is high for register nine, which again is coming from our DMUX down here. And you see the signal's high there. So everything seems to be working fine. If I scroll over to my outputs again, you can see that my uh, indexes were still pointing to one and two. But if I change my index, say, let's say, let's say I change register source index two, let's say I change that to nine. Then I expect to see for register source two, I expect to see the number nine over here. And in fact, I do. So I believe the register file is working. While the specification, the ISA talks about 32 registers, in actuality, there are only 31 of them. And the reason is because the register x0 always returns you zero. So having a register, an actual uh, piece of hardware in here to store and retrieve the value in x0 really doesn't make a lot of sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the register and I'm going to I'm going to put a constant in here instead. Let me zoom in. So this constant is going to be 32 bits, obviously, and it's going to have the value of zero always. And it's going to be wired up to, in essence, the Q value that would have been here if this was a register. And so you're going to ask, all right, well, so do we need a clock here? Well, no, because it's always going to be zero. So we're going to take the clock out. Do we need an input? Do we need data to write to it? Well, no, because it's a constant. So the input value is going to go. What about this write enable? What if we turn write enable on to register zero? What's going to happen? Well, in our implementation, Nothing's going to happen. Basically, it's going to the instruction is just going to be ignored, and it's it's almost it would almost be like a no op. Um, in point of fact, though, that's actually a fault. Or at least, if you're writing code and you 
and you know, you try to write to register zero as a programmer, you'd probably want to know when that's happening somehow. So you'd want the you want the CPU or or have be able have an ability in your program to be able to capture a fault like that to know that that's happening. I am not going to cover that scenario here. I'm just going to assume that the write is ignored or or I guess you could even say successful, but in any case, I'm just going to ignore it and go on. But I will record a video uh, later that talks about how to deal with faults and how to set up hardware to trap faults and uh, report faults. So in this case, this write enable for, for zero goes away. I will uh, leave the tunnel here. It won't actually connect it to anything, but that doesn't really matter. So that actually is a complete implementation of register file.